so we have Blake again. I think we've had you just once before, Blake, and uh, yeah. it's been a while, so I'm a little bit interested. I thought we would follow the internet meme of how it started, how it's going with your life, and then you have a new relationship. I kind of want to talk to you about that. So let's just first start with your like general life, how it started, how it's going. Uh, I mean, I've been out of prison for like six months, so... It is going, you know, um, a little bit slowly, but it is going. I got a job. I'm working for a moving company. Um, and, I mean, since I've been out, I've got in a little bit of trouble, but not, like, too much. I got caught driving a couple times when I wasn't supposed to be. Um, and, yeah, and I got arrested. Um, a couple of weeks ago for shoplifting. And were you shoplifting? Uh, yeah, I was guilty as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen with that charge? Are you going to like plea out to like some sort of infraction or something? I mean, isn't that going to um, break your parole? No, I'm probably not going to do time over it. But it will thin ice, basically. <sighs> it does what? I'm on like thin ice. I'm probably not going to do any time though. Oh, okay, but so it's not going to violate what? your your con the conditions of your parole. Or no, you're not on parole, are you? Or you are? I am. I okay, am yeah, you're on parole. So, uh, so like, uh, why? I I don't understand criminal law as much as I probably should, <laughs> being an, an attorney. But like, why doesn't this shoplifting arrest potentially violate the terms of your parole? Um, only because they didn't choose to violate me, really. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Okay. They could have easily. All right. So, you know, so how would you, th you know, like what, what aspects of yourself, your personality is like helping you make the transition and what aspects are, are like maybe not helping you make this transition from prison life to normal life? Um, I'm pretty like obsessive when I like decide to do stuff. So I think that's helping. Mm-hmm. Because I'm pretty determined not to go back. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also a little bit wild. And um, that probably does not help. So take, for instance, the shoplifting. So you're determined not to go back. Are you just kind of like shoplifting's fine because it's probably not going to trigger any parole violations? They're probably not going to like violate you, as as you said over it or is it you know that's when you're being wild and you're like who cares somebody seems to be watching yeah it was like that the second the wild one yeah yeah so yeah, what are like you shopping moment of weakness. okay so like i was stealing spray paint okay spray paint <laughs> you know it seems like spray paint's the one that they're like always watching over it too because it's going to lead to vandalism and is that what you were yeah. using it for yeah okay so it was like the, this was just the tip of the iceberg of the afternoon or evening that you were going to have with the spray paint doing literally illegal things just because what, to like kind of blow off steam or is it just to like stimulate your brain or what? Yeah, I just something to do, you know? Yeah. So is that, so this, this like kind of, uh, let, let, is, would you call it boredom? I'm going to use the word boredom, but I want to make sure first that it, that you would use it too. Yeah. Okay, so like this boredom, you know, how do you experience this boredom? It sucks. Like, how does it feel it's... like to you? Sorry, my house phone's ringing now. Yeah. Hold on. I was going to guess your burner right. phone, but that's a stereotype. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just like, I don't know, a very flat feeling. Flat yeah, I have a lot. So, I mean, the, how does it feel physically? Is it like, you know, is it all just mental or is there like a physical component to? No, it's a little bit physical too. It's like, I don't know, it's almost like being tired, but different. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like on a scale of kind of one to intolerable, what would you put it at? You know, is it like pretty fine? You can mostly get by or is it like, man, you know, I, I can't stand this. Sometimes it's like tolerable, but usually it's really not. 
Yeah. And how long have you experienced the boredom, like in your life? As long as I can even remember, pretty much my whole life. Yeah. Uh, and would, how much of the, the, let's say the badness, the wild or whatever else, would you kind of attribute to just the boredom? Um, a lot of it, pretty much all the reckless driving and all the petty stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, like the boredom, this is, I've heard uh, Aria say before, like boredom, like boredom's worse than being sick. She says, you know, it, and it, it, all, it, for her as well, it is like basically the cause of a lot of the things that she does, not all. You know, there are other kind of little causes, but it's interesting to hear. And would you say like the, the, your original violation, your criminal violation that you got you in prison, was that because of boredom or was that because of something else? That was boredom. And I uh, also like wanted the money. Yeah. So it's interesting to kind of think. So boredom seems to be one of these personality characteristics in you that's keeping you from having a little bit more of a normal life, right? Yeah. Well, definitely what do you like think about you know what are you planning on doing it and people can feel free to jump in on the chat or if you want to unmute yourself or something or chat to have me unmute you if uh, that's the setting i forgot what setting it is but like you know wh what sorts of things are you thinking in terms of like okay you know how to get rid of this boredom or how to treat it or how to handle it or how to you know and feel free to jump in too victoria although i think your audio might be a little bit weird um I just, I don't know. I do like, I do things, you know, to entertain myself. Like I, I do graffiti, uh, and I work out a lot, um, and read and stuff like that. And, um, I like to explore shit also like, um, like abandoned psych wars and things like that are always fun. Mm hmm well, have you, like, thought about, and these are just, like, random suggestions. I don't know why I've taken this little tack on this uh, call. But have you thought about doing things like, you know, where I live in Southern California, there's Venice Beach, and you can legally graffiti there. But that's not what you're looking for, I guess. I guess the thrill is the thought that you, it, you're, you might get caught. No, I mean, that, that's cool, too. They have that here. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what about, like, you know, so these abandoned kind of uh, sideboards and stuff. Have you ever thought about like taking people on tours or something of these abandoned psych wards, you know, and like making some money? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. You know, I always think about stuff like that because I was a little bit lucky. I think that, uh, I, I think, you know, like I had certain things that appealed to, to my sense of like stimulation, whatever that is. And part of my need for stimulation is also kind of a physical stimulation, like roughhousing, you know, and I see it too in my nephews, yeah. my baby nephews, they love to roughhouse with each other. And it's like, they kind of need it, you know? And I, I also had that. And I think I had it kind of like a little bit late too. I see my nephew, well, I don't know. Maybe dudes do have like experience a continuing need for roughhousing, you know, later in yeah, their life. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, you know, and that's kind of a weird thing because I think society's like, well, you know, that's violence. That's a violent urge, you know. And people have been asking me questions recently like, well, do you experience an urge for violence? And I'm like, well, if, if you mean kind of like roughhousing, and like kind of like getting, you know, either me smacking you around or me getting smacked around a little bit, not like smacking around, but you know, kind of like wrestling yeah. or like whatever, like a physicality to life, you know? And it's like, if yeah. I don't have that physicality, then it's like, uh, I, I do feel like kind of this urge, you know, coming up that's like, okay, you know, I, I feel like I want to do these types of things. But like one thing that I did when I was young is I, I skied, snow skied, you know, and did like even ski racing. And that's pretty dangerous, actually. People die all the time from skiing or something. It's not that uncommon. So that was really nice. The speed and the physicality of it were entertaining to me. Even kind of the, the people, you know, to get like either like a million people at the bottom of the hill or something and you're like just dodging them. And you're know, like, for me, I was like always like, I'm going to try to maintain as much speed as possible while dodging these people or, you know, or like the moguls, you know, I'm going to try to maintain as much speed as possible, you know, and even when I crashed, it was kind of like, that felt good, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're like spinning and rolling in the snow and it's just like, oh yeah, snow is getting all up your, you know, jacket down your pants or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I feel alive, you know, so yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Emmy, do that you goes- think that that is why, um, like, why those activities alleviate boredom is because they require you to have entire focus? Oh, this is an interesting one. So, like, a flow, flow state, flow mentality. Yes. Interesting. I, yeah, you have to be like when you do those things, your mind is fully occupied. You're, mm-hmm. You maintain such high focus that you don't feel the boredom. That's why it drives us. Yes, that's a very interesting idea. What do you think, Blake? Do you, do you think that that applies to you too? Yeah, I think like especially with like driving. Like when I would drive like really fucking fast. Mm-hmm. I would feel like very, I would feel like I was completely in the moment. I was, I was very like, very focused. And then when I would like drive, like at a normal speed, I wouldn't even be paying attention. Yeah. You know, and I would actually be terrible at it. Most of my car accidents were at low speed. Have you thought thought about racing professionally? Racing? Yeah. Yeah. Racing, like, yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, not really. I never really thought about it. I just, like, I just did it because I liked it, you know. Yeah, if you like it, then you can do it professionally and make money. Out. Yes, I agree. Even kind of professionally, what does professionally mean? I bet there's like some sketchy, like drag racing, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like what do we call them, leagues or something? Like underground. <laughs> Yeah, where they're like, you know, gambling for it and stuff, and it's like a little bit illegal, but, you know. Yeah, they have that here. Yeah, I would guess. <laughs> yeah, so maybe stuff like that, you know, get involved. You know, it doesn't have to be racing, but you know, it kind of reminds me, too, like my, I have a little baby niece. She's just like one and a half or something, but she came to visit California over the summer from where she lives. And she was like such a glutton for punishment for the waves. She just wanted to walk straight into a wave crashing on her. <laughs> and awesome. after it would do, she turned around and she was smiling and laughing. And she's normally not like a smiley, laughy girl at all. You know, she's just yeah. like, I just want to get pounded by these waves. And I was like, I totally relate to this because too, like one thing that I like, I'm not that good at surfing, but I sort of like getting pounded by the waves, you know, like a total wipeout smash, you know, so I think stuff like that is like, you know, like the boredom is a problem. It's almost like you have a chronic, you know, I don't know, like diabetes or something, right? And you can't ignore it because it's going to flare up, you know, it's going to flare up and cause problems. So you have to kind of deal with it every day, like with some sort of insulin that's going to take away the boredom. So I, I, that's what I think. What do you think, Victoria? Uh, I agree. And I've been thinking a lot, like, if the law enforcement were to make psychopaths commit less crime, what they should do that is most effective is probably make them not be poor. <laughs> you, you kind of cut out a little bit. So are you saying that law enforcement, if you're trying to come up with a society that's trying to reduce the amount of crime and knowing that there are psychopaths out there, then there should be kind of some sort of diversion or other program that helps psychopaths to deal with the boredom in a way that's not yes. illegal. I see. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, and give them a lot of money so they have. They well, can afford <laughs> yep. stuff. Could I throw something in here? And that is that I think there's a bit of a difference in what we're talking about, and that is that we're not just talking about a flow state. Some people, you know, they 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 do their backlog of sewing projects, and they're in a flow state. There has to be an element of risk. There has to be real risk involved. Well, that's an interesting question. Like, um, for the boredom, does there have to be, like, real risk involved? Uh, so you think so, Dan. And I think this is an interesting uh, suggestion about, like, is that is that true? You know, does there have to be real risk? Well, let's think first. Yeah, uh, I think so. For you, for you, you experience it that way, Blake? Yeah, I'm pretty much on the same page with him. But it could be like a risk, like a physical risk or something. Yeah. Or if it's if it's not that physically demanding, like you're not going to, you know, lose a finger trying to steal the, the spray paint, then it's the risk of getting caught or something, I guess. Yeah, it definitely does make it more exciting. And Victoria, what do you think about this? Do you have thoughts? 
yeah, I've been thinking about like military or you know helping the FBI or stuff like that. Those have risk. Uh huh. Or even like but, the bounty hunter or something, you know, yeah. like because Blake I mean, probably like, is not gonna become FBI now. Yeah, in Offense, those kind of careers, <laughs> in those kind of careers, um, they often require you to do stuff that's normally deep, illegal. Uh huh. Yeah, but if it's working for the government, and you don't get arrested for that. You get paid for that. So yes. I don't I don't love working for the government because I, I always feel like you're going to get caught somehow and then you're going to be in extra trouble. But yes, I think anything where you're getting kind of paid for that. But I think there's kind of like two. I'm going to like uh, and maybe you guys feel free to disagree with me. Uh, oh, Dan, do you have a follow up? Uh, yeah, I was actually going to say. Um, so I think the flip side of risk is power. So part of the experience is you know, doing something where there's significant risk, but what it draws out of me is a sense of kind of an exaltation level of power. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, like, you know, riding motorcycles and splitting, doing lane splitting in traffic. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going faster than everybody else. I'm everybody else, like your experience with slalom, Everybody else is just kind of um, an obstacle, kind of uh, kind of there as a challenge. Right. And in response to that challenge, you know, I feel intense and focused and definitely in a flow state. But, you know, it, it involves the risk and what the risk draws out of me, which is a sense of power. Or, or at the very least, a sense of coloring outside the lines, right? Of, of kind of uh, going my own way. So Dan, this is interesting. Do you think that it draws, I've always thought that too, especially I thought that maybe like 10 years ago, that the thing that I was enjoying most about these type of activities was a sense of power. But do you think that, because I've kind of like, maybe it's just me, you know, maybe I really did feel that way, you know, it's all about power back then. Or maybe uh, I am seeing my own feelings a little bit differently now. Now I would say it's less about power and more kind of about mastery in that situation. Like I am exceedingly competent at dealing with all of these crazy situations. You know, kind of like, you know, uh, you, uh, you probably, no one here probably has read Middlemarch, right? Does that sound right? By George Eliot. <laughs> I have. No. Oh, you have, Dan. Okay, so this yeah. is kind of a theme of Middlemarch, is there's like a normal person, the main character, Dorothea, she's like a normal person, and they, it, both in the front of the book and in the, the end of the book, they kind of bookend it with this idea that she is a great person, but she's never been put in situations where her greatness has been truly tested, you know, and so kind of the theme of the book is even though she hasn't done amazing things, she's not president of the United States, you know, like the book does take place like 200 years ago in England anyways, right? But even though she hasn't really, you know, done great things that most people would like remember her for in the history books, she, she had that capacity within her, I guess, is kind of what they're saying, you know, is that she had that ability, but sometimes I, I used to especially feel like I had all of these abilities, but there was no expression of them. You know, there was only expression of them, for instance, with Dan, where you're splitting lanes on the motorcycle. Or there's only expression when I'm like out there surfing, even, even though I suck, you know, I'm still able to get like hammered and still come up, you know, and be fine or the skiing or whatever else. So what do you think about that, Dan? Um, I, I have trouble separating that from power, this kind of mastery of something. Um, yeah, I love it when I'm in a domain where I feel like I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this. Um, I know how to do it in ways that a lot of people around me don't. Um, but to me, that, that's also just sort of a recognition of my own sense of power, right? Well, here's, here's like maybe instead of mastery, I just came, I thought of this instead. Do you think, and this is like an interesting question for everybody, like you can feel free to push back on me, but this is, I realize how I've started to conceptualize this, is that it's a more pure form of self-expression for me in those moments. And that, I think, is the thing that is really scratching an itch 
like when I live my life without the self-expression, everything is kind of a little bit blank, a little bit meaningless, a little bit pointless, because who cares, you know, that I go to work, who cares that I stay in a relationship, who cares all these different things. There's really no hook to me, kind of like making me engaged in my own life, you know, often. And these states of flow are when I feel truly, truly engaged. But I think the reason why I feel engaged in those moments, because I used to think, yeah, it's power. And I think power is definitely part of it, but it's, it's kind of part of it because it's like, you know, it's a sense of finally feeling like a little bit uh, self-fulfilled. You know, I'm like experiencing self-expression in that moment and it feeling like my true capacity in that moment. And I do feel powerful and that mm -hmm. feels great, but I also feel kind of uh, self-actualized. Yeah, I do, that totally makes sense to me in, in, in the sense of like, you know, let's take this capability of mine and see what we can really do. Yeah. What do you think about that, Blake? Both Dan's comment and then my comment. Um, I think I'm pretty much on the same page with that. Like oh, with both? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, especially the feeling that doing things better than everyone else gives me a sense of um of like power. Yeah. Is it just over everyone else or also over yourself? Like say I would go on a destruction mode and then see how good I can recover or how fast to do the same all of you. Yeah, so to kind of like, uh, because the, the sound again was a little bit... Uh, yeah, it was cutting out a lot. Don't worry. So she's kind of saying, is the, is the power that you're kind of seeking, Blake and maybe Dan too, is it, is it just over other people or is it also over yourself? So Victoria gave you an example. Yeah, it's both. Yeah, she was like, do you sometimes go into a destruction mode uh, and, you know, kind of destroy everything kind of around you a little bit in your life, you know, self-destructive mode, and then see how fast you can recover from it? Like, is that also like a game you will play to kind of scratch the itch of boredom? Um, well, I don't know if I, I, I don't do it on purpose, but that does kind of sound like how my life goes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like how my <laughs> life how my life goes too. Dan, do you have any comments about self-destructive mode? And uh, do you ever do that? Uh, I I did. You know, I'm 50. Uh, when I was younger, that was kind of the you know party hard business. Um, but I have a little bit of a hard time thinking about uh, sort of power over the other people and power over myself, like. Um, I don't really know how to make that distinction, actually. Yeah, I think, I think, <laughs> Dan, I'm glad that you're participating. It's awesome to hear. I think this year, and just to kind of explain, I think I understand what, what you mean by that, but just so everybody else understands, do you mean it's hard to make a distinction because it's kind of hard to understand yourself, you know, in your true motivations and like what's going on there? That's a good question. I think it's more like uh, I treat myself the way I treat other people. Like um, I am kind of a, uh, you know, half experiment. I think of a bonsai tree maybe, like a bonsai tree is growing and you kind of want it to develop in a particular way, but it's going to kind of do what it's going to do. So you, you trim it and you wire it and um, you, you know, you you kind of have 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 a significant amount of influence over it, but uh, and that's how I think of myself, and that's also how I think of other people. And I don't, um, I I don't know. Maybe I don't have a really strong distinction between how I relate to other people and how I relate to my own self. I, I almost treat my own self as if it were another person. I see. That's interesting. And uh, <clears throat> Dan, would you say like just a uh, kind of like a quick one-off question. Like, do you feel like you have a strong sense of self? You know, do you feel like, oh, I'm an honest person. That's why I always tell the truth. Or, you know, you have like this sense that, you know, you're X, Y, Z, and that's why you behave the way that you are. Or is it kind of like a very weak sense of self? And sometimes you surprise yourself and like, it's, it's sometimes difficult to answer questions about yourself. Like, oh, you know, do you, do you, you know, Dan, describe yourself in five words. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> 
I know exactly what you mean. Um, when I was younger, for sure, it's like, you know, who the hell am I? Um, and, and as I got older, as I got older, I started to recognize that who I choose to be with has a lot of influence over how I am. Um, and then the ability to kind of uh, kind of draw lines in the sand around who I am and how I behave. Um, I, 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 I think I have that ability um, to a, pr a pretty reasonable extent, but um, you know, I don't know where that emerged, but you know, it's definitely something that emerged. Yeah. So is this kind of fair to characterize you then? So like when you were younger, a weaker sense of self and very impressionable as a result, uh, especially from, you know, who you surrounded yourself with. And then as you grew older, you started to have a better sense of self, uh, although it may not look like the sense of self that normal people have. I, I guess so. It's a little, a little hard to, you know, look at who I was and say I had a weak sense of self. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I felt pretty intense, you know, I was a pretty intense person. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, if I look and I say, okay, you know, what are the situations where I lied to kind of get into a group or to impress people or, um, you know, I felt like I needed to be somebody other than, you know, the facts of my life, mm -hmm. such as they were, um, then, then that might be be an indication of a weak sense of self, I guess. Well, this is kind of good. So would you say, Dan, that like your younger self, your very intense feeling, I mean, it sounds kind of like Blake, right? Where he is now. Would you have any advice to Blake, you know, as somebody who's kind of experiencing, you know, what your younger self experienced about how to do anything about how to live his life or how to think of things differently? No, I sure don't have any advice. <laughs> <laughs> Love the honesty. <laughs> and then, Blake, I mean, does that sound like, is Dan describing, especially his younger self, kind of like what you're experiencing now? Yeah. Yeah, the intensity. And then, Victoria? Yeah. Uh, does, does that sound accurate to you, too? Uh, yes. Yes, and I have a question for Blake. Okay. Go Would ahead. you say the biggest problem with sustaining your life right now is the necessity to work. I, so, so she asked, do you think that the biggest problem to sustaining your current life right now is that you need to work in order to survive? I guess like if, if you were relieved of the obligation to work, would you feel like you could have a better sustainable life? Um, I don't know. I don't mind working really. I just don't want it to suck. Yeah. And what I don't what, want to do boring shit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so the boredom comes into the work too, I guess. You know, if it's like work that's too boring. Well, have you ever had a job that you liked? Not really. Hmm. All right. And Dan, feel free to jump in if you've ever had a job you liked. I know Victoria's in science, and I think that she finds that exciting. I'm in law, and I probably, though, you know, I, I probably couldn't do a normal legal practice where I'm showing up to a law firm, like, you know, 9 to 5, or for law, you know, a normal law practice would be like 8 to 10 or something, you know, kind of thing where that's your, your career. Because I just, I'm not that invested in other people, honestly, enough to kind of do things for me. And this is... Uh, something that I noticed about myself, especially in law school and college, is that I was very willing to stay super hyper-focused when it, I could see the direct benefit to me, you know, when I was basically like kind of leveling myself up, you know, so I didn't mind my first year of law school. I almost completely isolated myself socially. I had like two hours a week, you know, like kind of like a machine in which I was like, okay, I will, you know, uh, budget myself two hours a week of like social time, you know, of like going out with friends or something. Luckily I didn't have that many friends, so it wasn't, wasn't that much of a problem. But then I thought, you know, I'll spend the rest of the time studying and I did really well. And because I did so well in my first year, you know, I got like other opportunities that other people didn't get. I got like fellowships and scholarships and um, 
you know, opportunities to like write on journals and these different things. So for me, I knew that first year was like really critical and I was totally willing to do it. But now will I spend those same amounts of hours working for a law firm even just to make money? No, I cannot force myself to do it. I couldn't force myself to do it because I ultimately don't care. Money isn't that much of an incentive to me, enough of an incentive to me to do something like that. Maybe if it was like, you know, $10 billion, you know, yes, but not the sorts of money that they were kind of willing to pay me at the time. Uh, so I think, uh, I think for me, that was like how I kind of like got over like this inability to be engaged is I thought, well, even if I'm not interested in law school itself, which most of the time I was, I was interested in kind of like leveling up for my own personal benefit. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Dan? Yeah, yeah, actually, I was gonna, t I, I guess I'll, I'll out myself here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm in business um, and I have a couple times had like the perfect job for me. Um, and I'm actually kind of leveraging that into a, a novel I'm writing um, about somebody who like has the perfect job, but uh, for a sociopath. <laughs> um, but uh, so the perfect job for me, it turns out, um, is uh, getting into a company as a, a trainer or an organizational development person, um, because that is a job that is kind of outside of the production chain. Um, so I'm not really responsible to produce product or to make difficult decisions, you know, sort of exec level decisions. Instead, what I, what I get is I get knowledge of how the company works in all the various silos. Mm. So, um, and just, just, you know, having that, uh, perspective it, it, it's really something that most people in corporations, companies don't have. They're generally down in a silo where they kind of see their area of the business. Um, so that gives me like the capability to kind of talk at any level of the organization. So um, I'm able to talk to executives kind of about the concerns that they have and kind of the strategic goals of the company. And then, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk to kind of management and what their concerns are in terms of optimizing processes and HR in terms of retention. And, um, and then, you know, I'll put together training programs that are like, all right, these are the goals. This is the workforce. These are the problems we're seeing. Let's, uh, let's make a plan to get from point A to point B. Um, but as it turns out, that's really easy for me. Um, that doesn't take me very long to put together like, you know, sort of a standard standardized training program. Um, but what I like about it most, and, and now that I'm working from home, I have all kinds of flexibility in my schedule. Um, and right now I'm with a global company. So if I want to work at 10 o'clock at night, I can interface with people in uh, Asia. And if I want to work early in the morning, I'm interfacing with people in Europe. Um, so I, li I like that a lot. But um, so I'm writing, I'm writing the, 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 the fiction that I'm writing. Um, is about somebody who goes into companies um, as a consultant to help them get compliant or to, to pass an audit for the you know various standards that apply to organizations you know an ecological use standard or a security standard there's a million of them um, but what he's really doing is he's assessing the company for buyout potential mm. um, so, and, and you know, I just love the experience that this guy has of kind of getting to know everybody in the company and getting to know all the areas of business, pulling all the information together, but he's the only person who knows that everything about here is about to change. Yes. I like that kind of corporate espionage angle. Well, this kind of, uh, we yeah. just have a minute left, and this kind of, in some ways, has answered uh, Paula's question. She says, uh, she's uh, detected a flaw in herself as a psychopath when things just go don't can't go the way that she wants she loses control and gets very angry with people around her she's fired from two jobs due to this has it happened to me any idea to lo avoid losing control and I think uh, kind of Dan has answered this a little bit and given some good advice to Blake too 
in the sense that it's like you can't control everything, but if you give yourself more flexibility in a job, you know, you can choose your hours. It appeals more to your strengths and weaknesses than other jobs do. Honestly, that's the, the way that I've found best to do it. I think you can't control your circumstances that much, but I think that that's the best that you can do to help. And with that, we only have five seconds. I will wish oh, you goodbye, and uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Take care.